All we've got to do now is to start pumping. What is going on, everybody? Welcome in to the Week 12 NFL Recap episode of the Fully Inflated Football Podcast. I am your host, Marcus Whitman. A great Week 12 to recap here. Some big-time games, some big-time playoff implications. It is playoff picture season where you can't get through a quarter on these broadcasts without them pointing out who's in the playoffs, who's in the hunt, and I love it. It just raises the stakes for these games and gives us even more to talk about here. So let's have some fun here today, and I want to start with one of, if not the biggest games from the weekend, and that was... Eagles Bills where the Eagles win this game in overtime 37 to 34 after the Bills take the ball go down the field and then a little bit of a third down miscommunication between Gabe Davis and Josh Allen leads to the Bills taking the field goal and then the Eagles get the ball back storm down the field with a walk off Jalen Hurts rushing touchdown this game had everything man it had offense it had defensive plays it had two great quarterbacks playing great going to head to head it had overtime it had bad weather conditions i was obsessed watching this game back on on a tuesday because um uh, i i did have early dinner reservations on sunday so i actually missed pretty much this entire game live but it was a little bit of a tuesday treat getting to get back through this game and you know, I, I got a lot of takeaways from this game, but the, the biggest of which is I do just feel bad for Josh Allen, who is doing everything he can to get this team into the playoffs, to put this team on his back. And that was a sensational performance in Philadelphia. I think one of the better quarterback performances we'll see this season, doing things with his arm, with his legs. I mean, with his arm, you have... It's just some incredible throws, man. You've got him knifing through cover two into those honey hole shots. There's a huge third down throw where he's about to get sacked, uh, just kind of off his back foot, throws about a 20-yard bender on a dime to Stefan Diggs, countless other nice throws to move the chains in this game. And then even on top of that, what he did with his feet, adding things out of structure, it's nothing new for Josh Allen. We know that he's capable of this, but what was it, five, six times in this game? The Eagles thought they had him dead to rights, and he's breaking sacks, outrunning defenders, juking defenders, sometimes making throws on the run, sometimes just picking things up with his feet. This was a truly elite quarterback performance, and for him to walk out of this game with a loss is just going to be very frustrating for himself and for the Bills. They now have, I think, three, maybe four teams still ahead of them in the AFC wildcard picture. And for a team that knows when they have a quarterback like this in his prime, to get through a season like this and maybe not even make the playoffs is just a really tough pill to swallow. Trust me, I know I came up with my love of football being an Aaron Rodgers fan and You only get so many years of that player in their prime, and it's just frustrating to be a fan of those teams when you have a quarterback playing like this and the rest of the team isn't doing their legwork on this thing. And I I know for Josh Allen, it's it's just a tough pill to swallow across the board. Now, he he, he did have one mistake. I I will point that out because... You know, for one reason or another, people love to hate on Josh Allen, and the hate has gone way too far, but th- there was an interception. I more just want to explain my thoughts on it because um, it did come at a bad time, kind of invited the Eagles back into this game, was a part of the collapse that the Bills had. They were up 24-14 to 14 in the fourth quarter, and this interception certainly didn't help. Um, but, you know, the Eagles were in a cover six and the the Bills are running a classic out and up concept where you have the number one wide receiver on the outsides running a go ball. The number two wide receiver from the slot is running a out route. And this is a vintage cover two beater in the NFL. You want to read the leverage of the outside corner. If he sits down, you want to hit that honey hole shot as Josh Allen had hit several times in this game already at this point. 
And if he drops with that, that go ball, you hit the speed out and pick up six, seven yards. And because the Eagles were in cover six, I do think it's possible that Josh Allen misread this. So cover six is going to be cover four on one side of the field, cover two on the other side of the field. And he he ended up throwing this interception to the cover two side of the field. But if the disguised or split coverage caused some confusion for Josh Allen to the point that he thought it might have been cover four, it makes sense why he threw the out route, right? Because if that's cover four, that's the correct read. You should have the leverage on that curl flat defender to hit the out route. So I believe Josh Allen probably thought it was cover four, misread the defense, and also an incredible play by James Bradbury, who's just one of the best zone corners in the NFL, who completely read it out, broke on the play, and a huge clutch interception and defensive play so you know that was definitely a highlight from this game but really other than that Josh Allen was sensational and for him to have the accuracy and ball placement um, and velocity in these conditions is just so impressive so it, it really was a bummer to see the Bills lose this because even though you know I picked the Bills to miss the playoffs and it's good for my take if they do um, I, I just I find myself pulling for quarterbacks that are playing at this level because I think they deserve really a defense uh, and a surrounding cast that can turn performances like that into a win, which isn't asking that much. Um, And then on the other side, Jalen Hurts, man, he he stepped up and went punch for punch with Josh Allen in the second half of this game. I I didn't think Jalen Hurts played a good first half uh, really at all. Uh, but he woke up in the second half and led a a crazy clutch second half that um, wasn't just the field goal drive uh, that forced overtime. It wasn't just the walk-off touchdown drive in overtime. It was really to start the second half. He started to see the field and push the ball downfield really well. He threw um, a very similar deep cross to the one I described with Josh Allen earlier, where he's kind of off his back foot, lays it out there, hits Devonta Smith in stride. He had another beautiful touchdown to Devonta Smith down in the red zone, kind of laying it up in between zone defenders and a great catch fight by Devonta Smith, but just a really good read and ball placement on that thing. And then he throws the big time touchdown to Olemide Zacchaeus of all people for the Eagles. Um, you know, this game was kind of like, uh, <laughs> the first thing that came to my mind was how much help does Hertz need, but it's more of like how many pieces do the Eagles need? Cause it, some of the heroes in this game were a Lemony Zacchaeus on this catch and the freaking kicker who makes a 59 yarder to force overtime in the rain. Um, they just have so many players that can make plays, man. But the throw from Jalen Hurts on that Zacchaeus touchdown was, it was like third and 15, the, the Eagles are in a tough spot trying to come back and win this game. Jalen Hurts extends the play to the sideline, and then right when he's running out of time as the defenders are breathing down on him, he lays it out there in what originally, like when he first threw it, I'm like, I mean, that's a classic F it ball, um, you know, third and long. Hopefully it just doesn't get picked. Um, but you rewatch it, and you can see why he made that decision. Zacchaeus had broke to the back of the end zone. Micah Hyde who had a really rough day, by the way. He is 33 years old, and he looks pretty cooked. But Micah Hyde gets his head turned, and Jalen Hurts puts some incredible ball placement on this thing. I mean, Hurts continues to wow with his accuracy compared to what he was as a college prospect, but really put it in a spot where uh, even a smaller receiver like Olemide Zacchaeus could go get it. So Jalen Hurts had a a great second half. And, uh, you know, I was on Twitter saying he should not be the favorite for MVP and I, I still believe that, but I do understand after a clutch second half like that um, why betters are turning to Jalen Hurts. So, I mean, it, this win didn't really mean that much for the Eagles. They have a, a decent si- a, a decent gap between them and the Cowboys in terms of winning that division, uh, but this really hurt the Buffalo Bills and their chances uh, at the playoffs, but it, I, I actually end up walking away from this game feeling better about the Bills because of the way Josh Allen uh, was able to play in this game. 
Um, now, outside of the quarterback play here, I do want to rip on Sean McDermott a little bit. This was a horribly coached game by McDermott, who is, of course, the defensive coach for the Bills, um, a team that gave up 37 points here in this game. Um, you know, he actually had a good first half. I think they had a good game plan out the gate and, you know, did a good job covering on the back end. They were, um, you know, forcing some pocket mistakes, uh, whether it was um, – well, they just kept Jalen Hurts in the pocket is the way I want to wrap that thought up. Um, anyway, the first half was good. The game plan was good, but the lack of adjustments, I think, really showed up. And I think they played pretty scared in the second half, especially when you look at the the way that the run, they, they were not able to adjust to the Eagles run game in the second half. Um, just Hurts running all over them, Swift running all over them. Uh, that's been the Eagles' kind of counterpunch, and they weren't ready for it <laughs> at all. They got ran all over in the second half. But you look at the field goal drive. It, this is one of my least favorite things that defensive coordinators do, what I'm about to talk about here. the So the Bills go up 30, it would have been 34 to 31 with like a minute and a half to go, maybe two minutes to go. Great throw from Josh Allen to, to Gabe Davis to take the lead. And the Eagles are sitting there just needing a field goal to force overtime with a timeout or maybe two timeouts. And Sean McDermott is out here playing like, you know, two shell conservative deep zone defense. And Jalen Hurts had to have six underneath completions on that drive. And it's just infuriating. It's like Jalen Hurts is a smart quarterback. He's going to take what you give him. And why would you not try to take the fight to the offense? And it was just snap, dump down, snap, dump down, snap, dump down. And this drives me crazy because it is just playing scared and terrified. If they needed a touchdown, maybe you can justify that game plan. But the fact that all they needed was a field goal, I think it's just so stupid. Um, so just horrible there. And then the Eagles actually make that field goal with 20 seconds left on the clock. And I'm assuming this is McDermott's call. The Bills, who have Josh Allen, who's running free all over the Eagles' defense, they have 20 seconds and a timeout, and they need the ball out to go to overtime. Like, really? So you you just you completely just played for overtime in the last two minutes of the game against the best team in the NFL or the second best team, depending how you feel about the Niners in Philadelphia. Like that's horrible, horrible coaching. Um, and then there's, again, there's another defensive call in overtime on that game winning drive third and four, and they're playing two shell way over the top and they just allow a free release to the flat for Devonta Smith. There was no one within five yards of him. And Jalen Smith, uh, Jalen Hurts is like, okay, snap the ball. There's a lot of cushion there. He just lays it out there, first down. I just thought McDermott had such a bad, uh, was such a bad coach in this game. And I'm just, I'm, I'm ready for the Bills to move on. I've been saying this. McDermott is a fine defensive coach, but he's not an elite defensive coach. And that was on full display. In this game, he's a tier two defensive coach. If you're going to have a defensive head coach, I need that guy to be tier one. And at no point in his entire career have I ever felt like Sean McDermott is a tier one defensive mind in the NFL. So just really frustrating coaching from the Bills side. And of course, they have injuries and, and stuff, and, and that doesn't help. But um, some of the scheme stuff, some of the decisions, it, it just it, it's not a personnel thing. It's a, it's a coaching and a scheme decision. Um, and then I also just had one more little note, and I'm not trying to say this to knock on Jalen Hurts, but I do find it fascinating. Um, this is the second time this year that Jalen Hurts has had a – they've run like a little <clears throat> play action with the flat route kind of off the play fake. It's the second time this year, I think it was the Dolphins game, where Jalen Hurts has thrown to the flat – and there's been a defender right there who ends up deflecting it up and it gets intercepted. Um, for one, that's a point that two of Jalen Hurts' interceptions are pretty fluky and weird um, when you look at the end-of-season stats and the MVP race and all that stuff. 
and not necessarily his fault, but it is something that just came to my mind that Jalen Hurts isn't doing right now. Think to all of, for those that have watched my, like, my Caleb Williams film breakdown or my Jordan Love analysis, or um, there's been multiple quarterback film breakdowns that I've done um, <clears throat> recently where I talk about how the quarterback changes his arm slot on screens and play action and throwing sidearm or taking side steps to get around those defenders that are breathing down him with their hands flailing, trying to be a wall in between him and the, and the quick pass. And, you know, there are quarterbacks that do this and they'll throw it sidearm and work their way around these defenders. Um, and we just kind of gloss over it as if, yeah, you should do that. Well, this is just an example that not every quarterback does do that. And Jalen Hurts has gotten in trouble a couple times because of it. I think it's more of a credit to those quarterbacks that are able to bend the ball around those types of players than it is knocking on Jalen Hurts. Um, but it was just kind of a random observation that um, is something to kind of keep in our back pocket as we get into like college film breakdowns and stuff. Um, that it's it's kind of an underrated trait. Those quarterbacks, you know, like Brock Purdy is really good at this. Mahomes is really good at this. We just kind of gloss over it, but it's it's a real thing that really helps and can, in some cases, avoid interceptions. You know, <laughs> you can turn an interception into a completion in a lot of cases. So just just a we don't need to spend any more time on it, but was a thought I had here. Uh, but overall, obviously, a really fun game, and uh, I, I hope the Bills can sneak into the playoffs and, and give us some entertainment because, man, Josh Allen is fun to watch when he's playing like this. All right, next up. We have what was kind of the other game of the week, if you will, that totally lived up to the hype. Houston versus the Jacksonville Jaguars. The Jaguars take this one 24 to 21. But what's interesting here is if you take the missed field goals off the board, this game was 27 27 in regulation because the Texans attempted a game tying field goal um, right before half. Uh, or or the the over, potential overtime, and that was the second missed field goal for the Texans, and the Jags also had a missed field goal. So this game really was just punch for punch, two great quarterbacks putting their talents on full display, and just sign me the hell up for a decade plus of C.J. Stroud versus Trevor Lawrence. I thought both these quarterbacks had great games. Um, C.J. Stroud, it's... I'm just watching this like questioning everything because say what you want about me being too low on CJ Stroud and loving Bryce Young too much and all that stuff. Like guys, I watched all of CJ Stroud's college tape and I keep saying he's Georgia game CJ Stroud, but I watched like 17 CJ Stroud games, 16 of the 17. He was nothing like this quarterback. He is out here extending plays, manipulating pockets, genuinely showing some of the best pocket presence of any quarterback in the NFL this season. He is resetting pockets. He's scrambling when he needs to. He's staying in clean pockets when he has them. His instincts outside of structure, his accuracy out of structure, all of those things were legitimate question marks from his Ohio State tape from the start of last season, the Notre Dame game, especially like just go watch that Notre Dame game. If you don't believe me, take 20 minutes, watch his Notre Dame game and compare it to what we're seeing right now. He's a different quarterback, man. He something clicked between the Georgia game and his NFL career, but a total tip of the cap, man, because he is still giving you that in structure stuff, but the out of structure really in the last month, it's been like, where did this come from? Um, M multiple plays in this game that were just incredible. I mean, he has the touchdown down in the red zone where he gets a three-man rush, and that's where you're talking about the pocket presence and the pocket decision-making where he's navigating the rush and doing the thing I've talked about where he'll roll out, but if he still doesn't see what he likes, he'll check He'll check the pursuing defenders. He'll check his blockers. And he's been rolling back in, buying himself another three, four seconds to throw. And he rolls. He goes all the way from right, all the way to the left, and then finds his receiver down in the red zone for a touchdown. I mean, that's elite playmaking, finding ways to convert touchdowns down into those tight windows down in the red zone, especially when the defense is going to drop eight and take away what you bring 
in structure early in the play. There's another one. Um, you know, honestly, he had multiple throws on his college tape where once he got on the move, he would sail balls. He would he would short arm balls. Like I I thought like his I felt like his arm talent and ability to throw with accuracy on the move was a relative question mark for his college profile, especially compared to like Bryce Young, who was so good at it in college. Well, here he is in this game. He's rolling out right, kind of throwing not all the way across his body, but it's not, you know, he had to he had to get his hips around and he throws it. It's it's a it's one of those classic play action boots, and he's got Tank Dell rolling on like a 18 yard depth crossing route. And there's a zone defender working back towards Tank Dell. And he throws it in the perfect spot where he's still leading Tank Dell, but he's able to kind of elevate and grab it away from the defender. Like the one spot that's the perfect ball placement, especially with what we've talked about with Tank Dell being five foot eight and needing specific windows with his catch radius. I'm just in awe. Of some of the stuff, some of the stuff CJ Stroud's doing, um, and yeah, I mean, whether or not they make the playoffs or whatever, like I'm down for them to make the playoffs, but they are going places, man. They still have some holes. Um, some of them were on display in this game. I still think the Texans' pass rush is going to be a big need for them. I mean, even Will Anderson himself, it's not that he's a need, but he's just early in his development cycle. He really hasn't been that big of an impact pass rusher. I think he just needs to continue to add some play strength and, you know, be less of a rookie. Uh, not everybody hits the ground running and, and is a dominant pass rusher right away. Most aren't. Um, so, like, they're ahead of the curve on his development, and they need some other pieces. Like, their interior guys are not all that good. Um, and then they did feel some issues on the offensive line this game. Titus Howard, I, I don't know if he was playing hurt or or got hurt because he was playing so bad or what. But in the first quarter of this game, he was embarrassing. He couldn't block anybody. Titus Howard, who they gave a, a big contract extension to be their right tackle, but they've put him at left guard because their free agent George Fant is playing so well for them at right tackle. Uh, Titus Howard was a problem for them. So they still got some issues on the O-line, but man, this team is going places. And that's it's not just Stroud. It's it's the coaching. I, I mean, I really hope they can keep Bobby Sloak for another year because uh, he's doing such a good job. D'Amico Ryan's with his defense. Um, but these receivers, man, um, Tank Dell, he's getting overshadowed by how well Stroud is playing, and that's totally fair. But Tank Dell's been one of the best wide receivers in the National Football League this year. He's He separates as good as anybody. He's explosive after the catch. He's been a deep threat multiple times. He's been coming down with tough catches down the field. Um, you know, I think it was, was the first game of the year, maybe. Was that the Ravens game or maybe the second game of the year? Um, Stroud actually underthrew Tank Dell into double coverage, and Dell worked back and came down with the catch. We're talking about... A five foot nine, 165 pound wide receiver that's bodying defensive backs down the field. Um, and he actually had his best play of the game wiped away. And I, I was watching the L22 for this game, so I don't even know what happened. All I saw was him mossing a defender down the field on what was, you know, a third and long arm punt from CJ Stroud. Um, but this was all Tank Dell just going up over the defender, winning one on one. I'm like, I mean, he can jump. He he's he's got great hands, which was an. Uh, I mean, I'm just blown away, man. Tank Dell, so blown away. I'm smacking my microphone. The biggest knock on Tank Dell, other than his size, was he had like 14 drops in his last college season. And you're like, oh, he's got small hands. He's a little small. He's got a bunch of drops. Well, you know, maybe it's just you give him an accurate quarterback like C.J. Stroud so that a lot of the times he's not overextending or tripping over himself while he's going for some of these passes. He's got great hands. He's got great ball control. Um, and, yeah, I mean, he's just he's been ridiculous, not to mention Nico Collins has been a true X for them. Nico Collins made a bunch of plays in this game too. So um, they, they are going places. I think I saw people saying Houston needs, you know, someone was saying Houston needs a Jerry Judy. Houston needs a Devontae Adams. I mean, I definitely don't think they need a Jerry Judy. I don't even think they need a Devontae Adams based on what it would cost them to get him. 
they are set at wide receiver, man. These guys are balling out. Uh, so they end up losing this game. The missed kicks were a huge part of that. They played as well offensively as they could have. Um, and a lot of it was just these star players making plays. Stroud, Dell, Collins. As I'm going to talk about with the Jags, a lot of this was reactionary playmaking. I, I actually felt like the Jags did a good job of forcing the Texans to play off script. And it didn't matter. They just kept making plays. So, um, yeah, I, I think they lived up to basically having to go punch for punch with one of the best teams in the NFL, and they did it. And they very well could have ended up winning this game. And then as far as the Jaguars are concerned, they continue to roll. They're just very quietly stacking wins right now. And I think what's what's so quiet about them is two things. Number one is it's actually their defense has been really good this year. I, I think across the board, you know, if you're a defensive coordinator and you're watching this film, you're happy with your game plan and you're happy with how the guys played. I mean, they shut down the run. They were getting after it. The stunts were working. They were pressuring C.J. Stroud. The coverage was tight. Everything that the Texans got was either a contested catch, a dime by C.J. Stroud that's like the perfect throw um, that, you know, it's just indefensible, or um, it's reactionary plays where it's just you can't ask your defense to cover for eight seconds a lot of times. And I just I think Caldwell's doing a great job kind of implementing Todd Bowles' defense here in year two of this system. You're really starting to feel the chemistry, whether it's running stunts or passing off zones on the back end or um, the timing of, of when they want to do what. Like They're really coming together as a defense. They're really sound on the back end. Um, and offensively they're a little quiet because they keep having these almost their performances and you know they've done enough to win a lot of these games because even when they make mistakes Trevor Lawrence is going to keep gunning um you, you're going to get some explosive plays in there with some of their playmakers uh but I do think they've been a little bit more quiet on the season offensively because they keep having these games like this one where there's like two or three random things that happen that take points off the board and take stats off the board from Trevor Lawrence. And what's crazy is Trevor Lawrence threw for like 380 yards in this game, was great, um, but his stat sheet could have looked a lot better because you have he, he dropped a dime to Calvin Ridley that, again, is like right in his bread basket. Would have been a tough over-the-shoulder catch from Calvin Ridley, but if he's the number one wide receiver, he catches that ball. And how many times have we said that with Calvin Ridley and Trevor Lawrence, where it's like, oh, they're just so close. So you're talking about 40 yards and a touchdown on a great throw from Trevor Lawrence that wasn't converted. You also have another play in this game. He throws a good ball to Christian Kirk like 30 yards down the field, and it's one of those plays that it's a chemistry ball where if if the defender is I don't know if it's if the defender is ahead of you or with a certain leverage um uh, Rodgers and Adams used to do this all the time where you actually want that ball thrown to the inside it's counterintuitive but the the thinking is that as long as you know you're putting the ball there and the receiver knows you're going to put the ball to the inside the defender who has his head turned is not going to know to turn around and take two steps inside. So Lawrence throws it inside. Kirk works inside. And the second he goes up for the ball, I kid you not, there is a sliver of sun that was probably three yards wide that was specifically right there when Kirk looks up for the ball and he kind of struggles to reel it in and it gets dropped. So like literally just random nonsense, um, a ball that probably should have been connected on, but the sun just gets in his eyes and, and leads to a breakup. And then Trevor's interception, the Texans got away with an obvious pass interference on that interception. It's, it's uh, I don't know if it was an RPO or um, a fake, you know, slant flat situation, but basically Trevor's just trying to throw a quick five yard slant to, um, to Ingram, Evan Ingram. And Jalen Petrie, 
was going in the opposite direction past him and totally hooks Evan Ingram, slows him down by about a yard and completely throws off the timing of the of the play. And the ball goes right past Evan Ingram and into the hands of Derek Stingley. And it, Ingram's throwing his hands up like, look, I know that's subtle, but that completely changes the outcome of that play, and that's a penalty. So Trevor's interception was not on him. Now, it did even out later because... Uh, if you want to debate ref ball, it did even out later because they they got the Texans down on the goal line for um, like just comp- a horrible p- holding call um, that gave the Jags a first down. So it, it evened out a little bit. But I- I'm just saying Trevor played really well. I don't think people are saying he didn't play well, but this really could have been a 450 yard three touchdown day with no interceptions that. You know, maybe we start talking about Trevor Lawrence in the MVP picture if his stat line looks like that. Um, but there's been so many this year where it's just like random crap keeps happening um, that's out of his control, that's hurting his overall stats on the season. I think uh, people need to acknowledge that Trevor's playing freaking amazing this year. So this was an, it is just a battle, man. Just a complete battle. Great football game. Uh, let's see, what other notes do I have on this game? I, I did write down that, and I think Jags fans will know what I'm talking about here. The Jags run game just pisses me off sometimes. <laughs> like schematically speaking, what they do in the run game. It's just a very weird, unique scheme that Doug Peterson likes to run there. And and I can't be too critical of it because you do get, you know, basically it's a shotgun centric run game that's a gap scheme. I think every other shotgun based run game in the NFL is is more of a zone blocking scheme but the Jags I'm not going to say they only run gap stuff where you have pullers and um you know I, I like to lump like split zone where you have a tight end coming um across formation um I like to lump that in with the gap stuff because gap usually you're you're, you're exposing one defender to potentially knife into the backfield and blow up the run before it gets started. Um, but the trade-off for doing that is if you can get past that guy with a, you know, with a trapper or a split zone blocker, if you can get past that guy, usually you've got a great gap for a, a back like Travis Etienne, who's, who's a speed train runner that can gash you. Um, but it's just it's a very boom or bust running style, and they have a lot of just frustrating runs where guys are getting hit in the backfield. But what really bothers me is like if you're gonna do that and leave a defender basically unblocked or force a pulling tight end or something to get their hands on the guy before he can make the play in the backfield, don't do that with Will Anderson whose like biggest trait coming out of college was his rare quickness from the inside of the D line to like and his instincts to knife into the backfield and shut stuff down. There's multiple plays in the first half where they try to leave Anderson um unblocked and he just blows the play up. And then again, they have another poorly designed run they right before half. This was another thing that kind of kept some points off the board for Trevor Lawrence. He he throws right before half an absolute dime to Christian Kirk. And he gets tackled at the one yard line. And instead of kicking the field goal with like seven seconds left, the Jags elect to run the ball. And they run a toss into the strength of the defense. They did not have the numbers. And they ran the toss and it got blown up in the backfield. So I just a lot of their run game involves pullers and numbers mismatches and kind of overcomplicating things when they don't need to. And sometimes I think it does hold them back, but at the same time, you know, they will gash you from time to time with their running style and and with Travis Etienne and who he is as a runner. But it's just something that, you know, Jags fans have asked me to talk about them a little bit more. It's it's something that's been on my mind with them. And it's, I do think it's fascinating how unique their run game is. Uh, something to keep an eye on when you the next time you watch the Jags <clears throat> is how differently they do things in that phase of the game. Um, and then the last note I have here is Anton Harrison, the rookie 
right tackle for the Jags, had an awesome game. He really did put Will Anderson into a little box and tucked him away in the corner. He had a great day. Um, if he's playing like that, it's a huge upgrade for this offense because he was he was iffy. He was a rookie tackle out there going through his learning curves in the um, you know first half of the season. Uh, I'm not saying he's through the woods yet, but that's a good pass rusher in Will Anderson that he was really locked down against. So um, just, I mean, a good game for both teams. I, I end up, ended up feeling probably better about both teams in, in this game, despite the results. Uh, but obviously a huge win for the Jags, who don't just push off the Texans a little bit in terms of like, it, are they a threat for the division this year, which is obviously important. Uh, but now, you know, the Jags, I got to look up their schedule here, but their, their schedule, like they they could get the one seed. And the AFC, is pr- it's deep, but it's pretty wide open, right? Like it's not like, it's not like the NFC where I feel like there's a clear three. You know, I do think the Chiefs are the best in the AFC, but it's much tighter there. I feel like, Why couldn't the Jags, if they avoid having to play an extra game, why couldn't they win two two games against the Chiefs or the Ravens or the Bills or whoever they have to play and and go to the Super Bowl, like especially if they get that one seed and home field advantage. So they get the Bengals next week and then at the Browns. Really good timing to get those two teams with their quarterbacks out. Then they play the Ravens. That's a huge game. That might be for the one seed. And then they finish up with at Tampa Bay, Carolina, and at Tennessee. So they could very well finish the year 13-4 and four and get the one seed. Um, and no one's really, I feel like, talking about the Jags as a Super Bowl team. But their defense is playing very good. Their offense is great. And they have a great quarterback. Um, look out for the Jags, man. Look out for the Jags. Okay, next up. <clears throat> Let's talk about Sunday Night Football. Baltimore Ravens visiting the L.A. Chargers. The Ravens win this one 20-10 in what was really just another incredible display of Mike McDonald's defensive coaching for the Baltimore Ravens. And I really think he is going to be one of the top, at least interviewed, head coach candidates. We'll see if teams feel like he is experienced and old enough to be hired as a head coach. And we'll see if teams are willing to go the defensive head coach route. But in terms of just whether offense or defense, assistants that are on their own bringing something to the table, Mike McDonald is doing an incredible job. He's scheming up pressure up front. He's got the team playing fast and cohesive, and the coverage on the back end has been this match zone defense that I bash on all the time, but they do it in an aggressive way and in a smart way where they all know their rules, they communicate well, and they've just been from the front to the back end all around so incredible on that defensive side of the ball, and that was more of the same here against the Chargers. And some of the best performers in this game, it was it was um, Kyle Hamilton, who I feel like I haven't talked about a ton. He had one of his best games of the season. They have, over the last three weeks now, moved him back into, into the slot. <clears throat> and I don't think he was necessarily playing poorly on the back end. He was playing more like 20 snaps a game as, as a free safety. A lot of those were going to be two shell where he's, you know, playing cover two or quarters or uh, cover six, whatever. Um, But they have in the last three weeks moved him back to slot corner where he played in his rookie season and was just all over the field. And you felt his presence so much more playing basically every snap as that slot corner. And. You know, he he can blitz. He can get his hands up. I compared him to Spider-Man because he casts webs over the short to intermediate part of the game where he can deflect passes and he's a secure tackler with these long arms. And if you try to pass on him, he's got reach and can break up passes. Um, But he had a play in this game covering Jalen Guyton from the slot on a deep corner route. Uh, He's stride for stride with the guy, gets a pass breakup. And that was kind of the knock on him coming out was he struggled to turn and run with fast wide receivers. And here he is covering that up. So 
he had a great game. He was everywhere. Uh, and, and you know, it, I just think back to that pick six he had against the Browns a couple of weeks where he's coming off the slot, swats it up in the air, and then has the body control and athleticism to secure it, get a pick six. That's where I think you play him. He is a very, very unique player. And, you know, we're always looking for player comps and stuff. I don't know if we're going to see another Kyle Hamilton where you have a 6'4", 215-pound slot corner who you just you just want to move all over the place, blitz him, drop him into zone, man him up, just do a lot of different stuff. He's a really special, unique type of, of archetype of player. Um, but they've they've found such a good role for him in that defense, and they really feel like they know how to use him now, which is just when the Ravens drafted him, it's like, he's a weird player. We'll see how he works out. But going to the Ravens probably couldn't have gone to a better spot. And Coach Mack deserves a lot of credit for using him correctly, too. Um, <clears throat> so he had a huge game, um, not just the pass breakup, but he he stopped a screen pass with some incredible sort of run defense against the screen. Uh, dude's a stud. Um, and then the pass rushers up front, uh, I've given I've given the scheme and Coach Mack a lot of credit for how he stunts and games the pass rush, and that's a big part of it here. I think they had like 34 – was it 34 pressures in this game or 24? I, I can't remember. Let me, let me double-check that so I don't mislead you here. Um, but, you know, obviously they do scheme up the pass rush. It, it was 24 pressures, which is a good number, not like an elite number like 34 pressures. Um, but – in this game, Justin Matabuike and Jadavion Clowney were also winning their one-on-ones. So you package that with the fact that they blitzed 14 different players in this game. 11 of them registered pressures in this game. So they're coming from every direction. You've got pass rushers like Matabuike, like Clowney. Owe has had good games this year. Um, their, their pass rush is relentless. And these linebackers, Roquan and Patrick Queen, were just everywhere forcing fumbles, like, just defensive everything for, for the Ravens in this game. A great performance. And and honestly, the, the Ravens' offense just kind of let the defense steal the show. They really didn't do much offensively. They had some impressive runs. Um, Keaton Mitchell continu- continues to be a total stud. Uh, he feels like a just a, 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 you know, a, a ticking time bomb in terms of, like, he could be a monster in the playoffs because he's not just fast. Like he is consistently breaking tackles, picking the right holes, a threat in the receiving game, a threat in the screen game. Um, he he just every time he touches the ball, he passes the eye test, and he's kind of like I know they didn't spend a first round pick on him. He was an undrafted free agent, but he's kind of like their Jameer Gibbs, where it's like we got to find ways to get him the ball more. Um, and then Zay Flowers as well had another kind of game ceiling run at the end of this game. Uh, where he's making guys miss on a jet sweep. He's just so dynamic. So it was really offensively, Lamar didn't even play all that great. He didn't need to. Um, he made the throws he had to, and they just they got some explosive runs from these explosive young players that they have, these two rookies, Keaton Mitchell and Zay Flowers. Uh, so, you know, the, the Ravens took care of business. They look really freaking good, man. They're right there. They are right there with with what we said about the Jags and and the Chiefs. Like getting that one seed is going to be really important, and then it's just going to be a matter of this team kind of. They've quietly kind of been like the Dallas Cowboys under Lamar Jackson, where it's like they're a great regular season team. They they win a lot of these games, but can they string together the playoff success? It's it's almost like they're in that category. They're almost in a lot of ways the Ravens of the of the AFC. Or, or the Cowboys of the AFC. Very excited to see what they can do. Uh, really the first time they'll be going to the playoffs without the Greg Roman offense, potentially holding back their their upside. Um, and then, I mean, the Chargers just can't stay out of their own way, man. I mean, where do you want to start? The the three fumbles, um, like that's that's a huge Chargers thing, right? Like huge games, Sunday Night Football, games on the line, and they fucking fumble the ball three times, like, so classic Chargers. I'm so sick of this team, man. There was other Chargers things in this game, too. Um, early in this game, the Chargers come out fast. They're driving. They're down to, like, the five-yard line. Herbert gets hit late-ish out of bounds. 
Um, and then the offensive line's like, oh, I got to go defend my quarterback. And he goes and gets a personal foul and backs the Chargers up to like second and 20. It's like, dude, not now, bro. Like your season's on the damn line. Like if, it, if this was third down and your guy got hit out of bounds and you got to go defend your guy or you're up two scores, like I get it. But that's a game altering decision for you to be the tough guy and go go defend your quarterback and go start a fight. Like, dude, you probably didn't even see the hit to begin with, which was borderline. But that was a huge penalty. Like, be smart, Chargers. Situationally, they are such a bad football team. Um, then you've got this Dean Leonard guy who did the Chargers draft Dean Leonard? I feel like he was like a seventh-round pick last year. Yeah, seventh-round pick out of Mississippi. He's playing. He's starting on the outside for them. And he's ass. He is complete ass. I'm watching this guy like, who is that 33 guy? He can't hang with anybody. He was targeted 10 times in this game, gave up eight receptions, uh, was missing tackles, missed two tackles in this game. And not only that, but what do we talk about in the Packers game? These guys not able to, like their cleats situation where they're tripping all over the place? Well, Dean Leonard slipped like three times in this game in critical situations. Like, can can we get the right cleats for these guys so they don't slip all over themselves? So, like, A, why is Dean Leonard playing? Maybe we need to say, A, why did you draft the guy in the first place, Tom Telesco? B, why is he playing? You can't find a better answer than him. Not to mention, Isang Bassi is your starting slot corner. The guy that was one of the biggest problems for the Broncos team that had a historic def- uh, horst- historically bad defense in the first quarter of the season. They cut him and have been way better without him. That Isang Bassi is starting in the slot? Like, where is the depth on the Chargers? Where did all their players go? It's it's like, how is this the same every week for the Chargers? Um, Then, you know, the last play of the game, game's not over yet. They're trying to, you know, t- I think tie it up or, or, or whatever. Like, fourth down, game's not over yet. Clear blitz look from the Ravens, and they have no answers for it. Like, no answers. They didn't look at the blitz. They didn't throw at the blitz. Herbert just takes a bad sack with no answers. I did not think this was a good Kellen Moore day, by the way. Um, I thought this might have been the worst game Kellen Moore has coached this year. I I felt like they went run, run, pass a lot. They just didn't have a lot of creativity to the offense. It, What a freaking frustrating day for the L.A. Chargers. And that's every single game for this team. If it happens three times a year, you're the Baltimore Ravens, right? You can excuse it. Because they have games like this too. But when it's every single week, something's got to change, man. And it's it's the head coach and it's the GM. Um, Tom Telesco deserves a lot of blame for the state of this roster too. I know we talk about them having star players, and that's true. But the depth for the Chargers has been a problem for years. And they have not been able to draft well in the mid-rounds. They, they can't fill out this roster. And the second they get an injury, which they seem to get more injuries than most people they completely fall into shambles. So I'm just, I'm so ready to see Herbert with a new head coach and a new GM and just get a new era here. It's time. Why, why, how is this, how, how has this not happened yet? After this loss, after the Packers loss, um, I guess it's because their defense technically played okay in this game, but not really. They weren't that good. It was another game, too, where I know I know we're deflecting blame from Herbert. I definitely don't think Herbert played the best game he's played. Uh, he still made some big throws, and, and it was another game, though, where you're sitting here saying Herbert played pretty good in a loss that wasn't his fault, but he also wasn't elite and super clutch when it mattered. It's just incredible how it's the same thing every single week for the Chargers. Um, and I can't wait to have this rant next week. Um, But let's move on. We've got the Saints-Falcons game. The Falcons win this one 24-15, really kind of in control from the outset in this one. Uh, It started off with some really bad Derek Carr play, including 
a brutal pick six down in the red zone, and this has been my criticism of Derek Carr for years, is he's just, I think, cementing himself as the worst red zone quarterback that I've ever watched. And it's so ironic that maybe two years ago, I would have said that was Matt Ryan. Um, But Derek Carr just freezes up down there. And it's not just the timid play playmaking, the fact that he'll just stand in the pocket, force balls, will not create. He will not do what we talked about with C.J. Stroud earlier, where if he gets a three-man rush, he'll buy time. He'll extend the play, create throwing windows. Derek Carr is going to be drop and shoot, even if you rush three. And he throws a pick six in this game. It's cover three, plain and clear. Derek Carr hits the top of his drop, knows it's cover three, but Jesse Bates just goes AWOL, sees Derek Carr staring down the slant, and just goes AWOL and beelines it, assuming Derek Carr is going to throw his first read. And he does, and Jesse Bates jumps it, and he houses it. Incredible out of, I guess you would call that an out-of-structure safety play. But that's the thing with Derek Carr. All of this is due to a lack of ability to process information and to react to what the defense is doing to you. He freezes up. You read cover three, the safety abandons it. The the slant was going to be wide open behind him. He was in a clean pocket, too. It's not like he was under pressure and had to get this thing out. He Instead of saying, oh, that safety just broke on that thing, let's take a second hitch and see what else I might be able to do on this play, he just fires it and it gets pick six. If he just takes a hitch back, looks to his left, he's got a touchdown. Um, there was other bad red zone plays too. Um, granted, he was trying to throw a fade to the rookie A.T. Perry, and they had a miscommunication. I think A.T. Perry just didn't know the play call. Um, rookie moment there. But, you know, there's other plays where Derek Carr, likewise, is just not bringing any, anything to the table down there. And this just brings me back to what I said coming into the year. I, I said this was the worst signing of the offseason for any team because Derek Carr – is, is not going to take this team anywhere other than maybe 8-9, and nine, maybe an NFC South title, and a first-round exit, and just more questions in the offseason. I think most Saints fans, a lot of Saints fans agreed with me, but I got some pushback. I, I've had a lot of Saints fans come to me this last couple of weeks like, you were so right. Like, this dude is no different than Andy Dalton. In fact, I pulled up some of Andy Dalton's numbers last year. Yards per attempt, Derek Carr is at 6.8, Andy Dalton 7.6 last year. Average depth of target, Carr is pushing the ball a little bit further down the field, 8.7 average depth of target to 8.4 for Andy Dalton. But big time throw percentage, 4.1% for Andy Dalton, 3.9% for Derek Carr. So it's not like it's not like, you know, if, if your reason for Derek Carr being better than Andy Dalton was he's going to bring more explosiveness to the table, he really isn't. Dalton's giving you more yards per attempt, a higher big-time throw percentage, and just .3 less average depth of target. Um, turnover-worthy play percentage. Oh, you thought Derek Carr was going to protect the ball better? Nope. Andy Dalton, even though he had all those interceptions last year, In some of those ugly games, a lot of them weren't his fault. Andy Dalton, 2.3% turnover-worthy play percentage, 2.9% for Derek Carr. Over a half a percent more. And then PFF passing grade, which I know isn't perfect, but it paints a a decent picture. Derek Carr, 67.8. Very average, very mediocre, like plainly sitting as probably the 25th best quarterback in the league. Let's, let's, Let's check. Um... Minimum 20% dropbacks. Derek Carr is 22nd in the league. Andy Dalton had an 81 PFF passing grade, which would have been good for 14th this year. So they could have just run this thing back with Dalton, probably had the exact same results, except they don't have a massive contract sitting on the table, and you can start to actually think about what the future is going to look like. Um, Horrible horrible decision to sign Derek Carr and this game was kind of the climax of it right like if you win this game at least you're in a good spot to win this division but you lose this game in large part because of Derek Carr 
and you give up first place to the Falcons to fall to five and six. Like they are sitting nowhere and they're in a horrible spot. As for the Falcons, credit to them for the win. First of all, I do think Desmond Ritter actually played pretty well in this game. He had the one interception, kind of forcing it to Drake London down the sideline. His second interception, I didn't think was really on him. Um, the receiver, I, I felt like um, the receiver kind of got bumped or they were going to the same play. It was kind of a weird play uh, down in the red zone. Uh, I saw I saw the replays. Like, I see what Ritter, where he thought um, Bijan was going to be, and it just it, it, it was poor execution beyond his control. So he did have he did end up with two interceptions in the box score, but I you know I actually felt like they they used him well in the design run game. He made some throws in structure. He actually had some pretty good velocity on some of his throws. I've been very hard on Ritter, but if Ritter plays like this, makes some throws, um, you know, they they're gonna probably win this division because I love that they came out of the bye week and Arthur Smith was like, let's get Bijan going, let's get him going here. And he had like 23 touches in this game, two touchdowns, very dynamic. Um, it was just a good, good Arthur Smith day. I I felt like um, they they came out, they executed, good game plan against a, a tough Saints defense. Um, and then for the Falcons defense, where would they be without the Jesse Bates signing? Man, I mean they have had so many games this year where Jesse Bates has swung the outcome of the game, and it wasn't just the pick six in this game that's. I mean, obviously a huge difference because if what's crazy too is it's not like it was a a regular bad read by Derek Carr. You know, most 99.9%, if not literally every other safety in the NFL is going to play as cover three and that slant was going to be there. But he went out of his play call, got in the way, made the play happen. So not only that, which was a potential like 14-point swing in this football game, but... He peanut punched a ball out too. He's got like three or four forced fumbles on the year. That signing has been the opposite of the Derek Carr signing. And I think I may have called that uh, one of, if not my favorite free agent signings at some point. So really that was on full display was, was a, I mean, the free age, this off season's free agency had a huge impact on this game. When you look at it, um, the Falcons upcoming schedule is at the jets, Tampa Bay at Carolina, Indianapolis at Chicago, and then they finish at New Orleans. I mean, they can they can definitely get to nine and eight and win this division. The Saints still have to play Detroit at the LA Rams and at the Tampa Bay Bucks. So those aren't easy games for them. Uh, I would say the Falcons are are the front runners in this division um, at the, at this point in time. But um, let's mo- let's move on. Cleveland at Denver. Denver wins this one 29 to 12. I did actually think this game was closer than the final score indicated. I think I think Broncos fans would agree. Um you know, Cleveland is right in this game into the third quarter. Dorian Thompson Robinson gets the start in this game. I thought he he did okay. You know, expectations are super low for him. His first start was brutal. Um this is, I think, his second start now, or, or his third start, but his second start since Watson got hurt, finally hurt. And, uh, you know, I, I thought he did an okay job playing point guard, made a couple throws, was getting Cedric Tillman going, which was fun to see, using his feet. They were doing some fun stuff with read options and play action. Their offense was functioning with DTR. The funny thing is... Their deficiencies offensively were not his fault. There was they ran two trick plays. One was they they brought in the the tight end for the tush push. You know the play where they motion the tight end to go under center and then run the QB sneak with him. They run that and they fumble the snap. So they give the Broncos the ball at midfield and then the play after DTR got hurt. Um, they ran a double reverse that they classic Cleveland Browns they fumble the second reverse and the Broncos end up getting it it's like a loss of 20 and a turnover so just brutal two trick plays resulted in turnovers for the Browns in this game Uh, and then you had a bunch of drops too Um, they had a two-point conversion that Amari Cooper I felt like should have had from DTR Uh, and then I think I can't remember 
if this was with DTR or with PJ Walker, but David and Joku had a pretty brutal drop. The ball hit him in stride. He was at a full sprint, and we've seen some of David and Joku's run after catch uh, on the season. And he let it go through his hands, and he might have he might have had forty or fifty yards on that play. There was one or two defenders to beat, uh, and he was at a full sprint. So a pretty rough drop uh, from Njoku, and a bunch of other drops too. So it really it really was just bad execution by the Browns' offense outside of the quarterback. Now PJ Walker came in; he tried to give the ball up a couple times, um, lost a fumble. So. That that injury really changed the um, outcome of of this game, or at least how close it was going to be. But obviously, a tough loss for the Browns. Either way you look at it, because this is a potential wild card a tiebreaker against the Broncos, and not only standings wise do they pick up a loss here, but they're walking out of this game beat up. Dorian Thompson Robinson left the game with injury. I think they're much better off with him than P.J. Walker right now. Uh, Amari Cooper left this game with injury at, a, at one point in time. Miles Garrett is dealing with an injury. Denzel Ward's not out there. Like they are, I mean, you're already out Chubb. You're already out Watson. You're already out um, uh, Con- uh, Conklin, their right tackle. They have suffered a ridiculous sum of injuries this year, uh, and it, it's it's probably just reaching the point where it's too much. Um which is again is a tough pill to swallow in a year that they really went all, all I can't say all in but they went very much in on this being their championship their main championship window season uh, as I talked about a couple weeks ago with some of their upcoming players uh due for for new contracts and Deshaun Watson's cap hit goes from like 19 this year to like 60 next year uh, but yeah definitely a frustrating day for for the Browns and for Browns fans uh, but Denver just keeps rolling, man. Their their game plan, they've they've built a game script that they try to follow and uh, can win with, and it's it makes sense, right? Like they've got an offense now that has an identity, and and I like the identity. It's a it's a throwback identity. It's a tale as old as time. It's every Big Ten football team. Uh, ever basically it's you know first down is run game play action screen game and third down is going to be shot plays and let the quarterback run around and make some plays and it's it's working for them I mean they have a great offensive line we need to talk more about how the combination of Mike McGlinchey and Quinn Miners on the right side of that offensive line that's one of the best side-by-side run-blocking duos that the league has to offer right now. Now, McGlinchey has his issues in pass protection, but those are two uber-athletes with dickhead mentalities that will flush you out of the, gra- out of the, gr- um, out of the ground I- I- against the run. And when, they go, the, when those guys get on a double team, you're going backwards. So it's a great duo. The rest of the line is good. you got multiple good running backs. And then I love that they're starting to get the read option game going they had nine carries for Russell Wilson which he has I think 26 on the season now so way more design runs for Russ this year Uh, they they get a touchdown off of one they had another chunk run and not only are you getting chunk runs out of those but that's just another way to open things up for the rest of your runs because if you have the threat of read option if you run inside zone that backside defensive end can't just collapse against the run so they've really built a good run game and then third down like russ is playing good quarterbacking he maybe had his one of his best games in terms of making impressive throws in this one a couple of just kind of beautiful touch passes into the intermediate to deep level um and you know improvising a little bit using his feet to extend plays. So like first and second down, they're protecting the ball. They have a plan of what they want to do. They have an identity with the run game. And then third down, it's like, okay, Russ, run around, make some things happen, make some good throws. And and if push comes to shove, chuck it up to Cortland Sutton because that dude's insane. And they, they had a couple almost connections in this one. I think one... One was called back for an offensive pass interference. I think there was another one where he was like pushed out or they just missed on it. But um, 
that's their game plan, right? Now, can can this team get from behind and come back and win games and pass the ball 35, 40 times a game on their way to victory? Probably not. Um, but this defense as well is complimenting them, right? They're playing very good team defense. And uh, how about uh, Nick Benito in this game, man? He was really electric, uh, which is fitting because my pro comp for him was a literal ball of lightning. But uh, he had a strip sack on P.J. Walker. He beat um, he beat Dewan Jones on a spin move in this game. And he had nine pressures, a sack, a forced fumble. Uh, Baron Browning was a little bit more quiet in this game, but those two guys, if they keep getting better, they're going to have something special in those two players, Baron Browning and Nick Benito. So, uh, you know, you got Sertan on the back end, Justin Simmons. Their linebackers are kind of underrated with Singleton and um, Josie Jewell. You got um, Zach Allen up front's playing pretty well. Like, they they have pieces defensively, and they've, they've put this thing together. Uh, Jaquan McMillan in the slot, having a great year. So, yeah, the the Broncos just keep rolling. And as I said on the power rankings, like a huge credit to Sean Payton, trading a first-round pick for him seems to have been well worth it, right? Like a lot of people laugh at coaching and how coaching can uh, overtake a a messy situation, and it, it wasn't great to start. He had a lot to clean up. And, you know, Sean Payton, for a little bit there, was looking like maybe he was going to eat his words a little bit about talking crap about Nathaniel Hackett and stuff, but that's come full circle. He has cleaned up the mess. This team has a culture. They have an identity. They're heading in the right direction. They have their own first-round pick. Um, The Broncos fans can feel better about their future than they have in a long time, and they've salvaged the Russell Wilson trade. Like That is nowhere clear... Uh, nowhere close to looking like the worst trade in NFL history. Like he's a, he's been a a very good quarterback this season. So we'll we'll see where the Broncos' season goes. Um, what's what's their schedule coming up here? Um, like how how legit should we take them actually going going to the playoffs here? So they have Texans this week. That's. That's a huge game. Then they got Chargers, Lions, Patriots, Chargers, Raiders. You know, they've beaten some good teams on this stretch. Teams like the Bills and Chiefs. But uh I don't know. I don't I don't know if they'll keep it up or not, but it's it's impressive nonetheless. All right. Um Tampa Bay at Indianapolis and the rest of these games are are going to go a little bit faster. Uh it is just the nature of you know, if something's something's interesting, if if something's big, we're gonna spend more time on it. But um getting getting more towards the less interesting matchups here. But Tampa at Indianapolis was still fascinating, still big playoff implications in this one. And the Colts win this one 27 to 20 in just an absolute Shane Steichen masterclass. And, you know, I'll credit Gardner Minshew, I'll credit the offensive line with with French fries, their center. Uh, Wesley French and their right guard, Will Fries, playing really well in there with with Smith and Nelson and Raymond. Their offensive line's been sweet. Uh, Jonathan Taylor running hard. Uh, Pittman continues to just be so consistent for them. You know, it's not like they don't have any players. Uh, but Shane Steichen's feel for game flow, feel for the RPO game, his ability to put these guys in positions to positions to succeed. He, he he's been the hiring of the year. He's been incredible. Um, I think we felt like the Eagles offense has missed him at times, and the Colts are six and five with a very functional offense. W- with I, I would just say average talent and a backup quarterback, or at least the thirty fourth best quarterback in the NFL. Like Minshew's playing well, but. To me, this is all about Shane Steichen, and um, you know, it's it's misdirection, it's it's creative play calling on fourth down where you're doing play fakes, and you got Mo Ali Cox wide open up the middle of the field. Uh, it's just the general game flow of when when to run, when to pass, when to go RPO. He just he gets this play design thing, and he gets this play calling thing. He's awesome. So. You know, another impressive win for the Colts, an important win as they are in the playoff picture. 
But whatever happens this year is house money because they're building something here for Anthony Richardson to come home to. And I don't know what this would have looked like this year with Anthony Richardson, but it's a very clear trajectory and in a lot of ways might end up benefiting Anthony Richardson. You know, it's it's hard to say that because I thought he was playing well and um, they might be even better if he were playing. Uh, but it's not always the worst thing to just let a young quarterback, he's going to be 22 next year with like, he's still incredibly green, Anthony Richardson. He's only started like, what, 18 games in his quote unquote professional career, including college. It's not the worst thing to say, hey, we got a great old line. We got a great play caller. We got playmakers. We know what we want to do. We're just going to plug Anthony Richardson into this thing. Uh, could be could be fireworks next year, man. It's going to be fun to see. Um, also got to credit the Colts defense a little bit. You know, they're playing really hard. I think Gus Bradley is just a really solid defensive coach. But Samson Abukum, we've we've talked about him being a great hiring a couple times this year, but he changed the outcome of this game, man. He had two sacks one-on-one against Tristan Wirfs in this game. Like that is, that's one of the best left tackles in the NFL. And he made him his son with a couple of, he beat him on a bull rush. Like he, Samson Abukum listed at like 250 pounds, bull rushed Tristan Wirfs into a sack. Like, think about that for a second. That's, that's crazy. And that's all just 250 pounds of effort, leverage, get off, and energy. And that's how he plays. Um, And then he had another kind of bendy strip sack on Baker Mayfield to end the game. And, uh, yeah, he's just been a great signing for them. He's brought an energy that they haven't had off the edge. And it's it's huge because Quiddy Pay is not doing anything for them. Um, As for Tampa... It's time to talk about this defense really struggling. You know, they're not fe- they have not felt like the Todd Bowles defense that they were in maybe the first 8 games of the season and it's just they're putting too much pressure on Baker. I mean, Baker's playing fine. He's played like one of the 32 best quarterbacks in the NFL this year and they've got Mike Evans, they got Godwin. They're going to make some plays, but you can't count on these guys to put up 30 every week. They're just not consistent enough. So when your defense is out here having games. Like, they gave up 37 to Houston. They gave up 27 to Gardner Minshew and the Colts. Like, it's just not going to cut it. And they have injuries right now. They really miss Levanta David. And it's just, you know, it's... They can't win games like that. the, 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 The game script for this team to win games was win 21 to 20. 20 to 17, that type of thing. They, they're just not going to hang with these injuries and the way their defense is playing right now. And I don't know that it's necessarily bad coaching by Todd Bowles. It certainly isn't great coaching. His name is going to get put into the hot seat conversations. And I wouldn't be surprised if they end up just kind of letting Bowles go, turn to a new regime, get a new quarterback, and just kind of start a new era in Tampa and really try to kind of maybe trade away some of these veterans and kind of get away from the Tampa Bay era and become a new version of themselves. And that's honestly probably the best thing for them to do and just build around Wirfs and Winfield and their corners. Um, But I don't know who wants this job. And I don't think there's a lot of great candidates. Like, I don't think you move on from Bowles to bring in Coach Mack. I from Baltimore. I don't think that. I mean, everybody's golden child this year is going to be, um, um, Detroit, Ben Johnson. That's going to be everybody's golden, golden target. I don't think Ben Johnson is going to take this job. He's going to have a lot better opportunities than that. So, they could fire Bulls. It might not necessarily be the worst thing, but they got to they got to get really creative. I think with finding a, a good hire as well. And I don't necessarily know who that would be that would be an upgrade from Bulls. So they're in a really tough spot, just like the Saints, man. Then we got uh, Kansas City at the Las Vegas Raiders. And this was actually a good game early. The Raiders got out early 14-0. And then it was one of those classic games, though, where you're like, I think I'm going to live bet the Chiefs down 14 because 
I just don't think they're going to lose to the Raiders. And the Chiefs just very quickly took back control. They had, um, you know, the lead and the ball back by the third quarter of this game after falling down 14 nothing. So they responded really quickly. But I will give Aiden O'Connell some credit. I, I thought he was going to look ugly, put the ball in harm's way, really not provide a lot of, like, big throws or explosiveness to the offense. And, you know, he's run the offense pretty well, and he's made now three weeks in a row, he's made some beautiful throws, and I'd be an idiot not to give him credit for. Um, so there's something there. I st- I still don't see a starter in Naden O'Connell, but you know maybe a high-end backup, something like a Nick Foles, maybe, where he's kind of a gunslinger. He's going to give his receivers a chance. He can read the field okay. Not going to you know extend a lot of plays, but you know he had a couple throws in this game. He had a dime against cover two um, down the left sideline, just perfectly laid it over the flat zone defender's head against cover two, a honey hole shot. Uh, and then he he threw a beautiful slot fade to um, Jacoby Myers, who's really coming on this year as like this complete wide receiver. Had a great game here. Um, but yeah, they're competitive with with Aiden O'Connell. They just they ran into the Chiefs, um, who heated up in the second half. And as the Chiefs, I think, have shown this year, as when as long as they aren't dropping balls left and right and getting horrible wide receiver play, which they're not going to get every week. They're, they're a top-tier football team. They have a great defense, and they have Patrick Mahomes. And they still have, like, they have good athletes. Like, you know, like Sky Moore can do some stuff after the catch. You've got Marquez Valdez-Scantling can still get open deep and do some stuff, uh, even if he has really bad games. And then they're really opening up Rasheed Rice and starting to unlock more and more from him. He had some really good plays in this game, man. Like, he did a lot of the good run-after-catch stuff, and when he hits top speed, it, he's a tough guy to bring down, man, because he's he's thick and fast. But um, they got a, they, they connected on a really nice back shoulder, and, you know, if, if Rasheed Rice can become Patrick Mahomes' chemistry guy and they can really build this thing up in the next month, I think they have plenty offensively. Um, and I should say perimeter chemistry guy where you're designing back shoulders and comebackers and timing routes on the outside. Because I still don't think Rasheed Rice is going to be like this vertical burner. Um, So working some of those intermediate throws with Mahomes could really unlock some stuff for this offense. Um, But, yeah, I, I don't have a ton of takeaways from this game. It wasn't really surprising to see the Chiefs pull away in this game. The Raiders still just don't have the complete talent to hang quarter quarter in, quarter out with the Chiefs, especially if Max Crosby is going to be playing, playing injured. He, he was not the impact he normally was in this game. Uh, I think he's pretty beat up. The Raiders also, after this game, released Marcus Peters. And Peters, Peters was having a, a pretty good season, a pretty good Marcus Peters season where he's, he's going to give up some yardage for sure. And he's going to have some missed tackles. That's what Marcus Peters does. Um, But he's going to make some big plays. Like he had that big pick six on Jared Goff earlier in the year. But they end up releasing him. And I think this makes sense. I I think, you know, Peters can go somewhere where he can compete. Maybe he can go to the Chargers would actually be a pretty good fit, I think. Uh, Would he complete his? No, he has not played for the Broncos yet. But he he could start trying to complete the AFC West circuit there. Uh, I, I think from what we saw from Dean Leonard, if the Chargers want to compete at all, I would go pick up Marcus Peters. But um, I kind of like it for the Raiders because they're out of the playoff mix. You're not going to have Marcus Peters next year. But you have Jacorian Bennett, a young third-round corner with a ton of athleticism. They also, by the way, picked up Jack Jones from the Patriots. You know, give him some reps, see if he can settle in, find a new home, and um, take care of things off the field. They have some young players that they can get some reps on. And, uh, you know, I think it's a it's a good parting of, of ways there. But, yeah, that, that game was pretty standard. Pretty, pretty expected outcome. Then we have the Rams at the 
Arizona Cardinals, and the Rams steamroll the Cardinals in this game as the game went on. I mean, the Car- the Cardinals were feisty in the first half, but they just they couldn't keep pace with all these these stud playmakers that the Rams have, honestly. Like, let's let's call it what it is. They weren't viewed as studs coming into the year. I mean, Cooper Cup was, but Tutu Atwell, Puka Nakua, and Kyron Williams, they're studs, man. They are studs. And the Cardinals couldn't tackle these guys. They were getting molly whopped at the line of scrimmage all day long. And it was just too much. I mean, the it really felt like the run game, the screen game, the crossing routes, like whatever it was that the Rams wanted to throw at the Cardinals, it you felt like the Cardinals were a team compiled of day three draft picks and undrafted free agents, kind of like they are. Um, and it wasn't even the best Matthew Stafford performance. I mean, he threw a really bad interception before half. He missed a couple throws. But the Rams just took it to him, man. It, there was no way around it. Kyler Murray said after the game, we just got our asses kicked. And, and he was right. Um, they they technically only had eight missed tackles registered per PFF. It felt like 20 watching this game. They're stumbling all over the place. Kyron, really, Kyron Williams, though, I will give him credit. He's just good. He's just a good running back. He's 5'8", 195 pounds, one of the least physically talented runners in the league. But he is... 195 pounds of muscle and resiliency. And he's got excellent vision. He plays low to the ground. He kind of gets lost in the trenches. He's really good at kind of sneaking through for three or four extra yards that you didn't think were possible. Um, really smooth receiver. Tough dude. The uh, the Rams broke out a play that's going around the league right now that I think you actually give Matt LaFleur credit for this one. He at least, as far as I can remember, put this on film first. And it's, ironically, there are all these Shanahan guys that are breaking it out. Um, but what, what play I'm describing is, is having the running back out of the backfield release in between the guard and the tackle. Typically, you're going to have that guy release outside. But the Packers did this with Aaron Jones maybe four weeks ago, where they released him. Basically, you have... What most teams are doing is they they go from trips left. You have all your wide receivers on one side of the field. You have them run to the opposite side, basically clearing out. And then, ideally, you have that inside slot wide receiver running at the linebackers, kind of setting a natural pick. And then you're just going to release the running back into the flat towards the sideline. Um, And... By releasing that running back, um, and I, I should have mentioned, you want to line the running back up on the right side of the formation. So he's coming across the formation and releasing through the offensive line. So a lot of times that linebacker is going to get drawn in, and the odds of that linebacker who's supposed to pick up the running back getting either bumped off by an offensive lineman or the receivers running across the formation are pretty high. And then you just end up with an easy floating pass to the running back towards the flat. And like I said, they, the Packers ran this with Aaron Jones. Um, it worked for them. We saw the 49ers run it the next week with Christian McCaffrey for a touchdown. Uh, this week, we also saw Bajan Robinson uh, doing it. Now, Arthur Smith um, put a little bit of a wrinkle on it. And instead of running more um, towards the flat, Bijan ran it like a wheel route, and they got a touchdown off of it, uh, like a 30-yard touchdown. Um, and then in this game, the Rams ran it with Kyron Williams towards the red zone. So we've seen this now circulate around the league. It's always funny to see which plays get picked up and with PFF Ultimate and how these um, teams have all this film and, and all these databases. They're able to just you know copycat league this thing so quickly. Um, but all, all four of those guys are Shanahan scheme coaches right you got um Lafleur, you got uh Shanahan himself you got McVeigh here uh with the Rams and um Arthur Smith is somewhere in that tree he very much runs the Shanahan scheme um but yeah 
it, you know, brings me back to the Play Callers podcast with Jordan Rodriguez. That it's just such a good listen to if you if you haven't heard it yet. But all these guys they steal stuff from each other, and uh, that's a play that's going around right now. I don't think we're that's the end of it either. Um, and then the, the Rams defense continues to be pretty frisky and kind of underrated. Like they have their holes. Obviously, they have all these fifth, sixth, seventh round players, some street free agents, you name it. But their secondary had a great game. Devon Witherspoon or, or um, Akello Witherspoon continues to have a really good season. Jordan Fuller is just such a good safety on the back end. He was everywhere for the Rams. Darion Kendrick is actually playing really well in the last month. And that's that's surprising. I mean, he he had like legit four seven speed coming out of Georgia, uh, but the Rams do a lot of the off zone stuff, so you can get by without great speed if you're a physical smart player. And Kendrick is that. Um, and then John Johnson is back. If you remember, he was on those great Rams defenses back in the day. Went to Cleveland for a little bit on a big free agent contract. They released him. He's back with the Rams. He hasn't been starting for a while. I don't know if he has surpassed Russ Yeast or what, but he's starting again, and he was making plays out there. So the Rams' secondary is underrated. You have Aaron Donald, and then Kobe Turner is a legitimate find for the Rams, and they've done such a good job finding these guys that slip through the cracks because of outlier traits, right? I mean, it all started with Aaron Donald, but... You know that they they trade away all their first round picks, but if they can steal value back and find guys that fell for silly reasons, you know Kyron Williams, great example, fell because he had no traits, but he's a good running back. Puka Nakua fell because he was injury prone. Well, he's healthy and he's really freaking good. Um, Kobe Turner falls to like the fifth or sixth round because he's undersized, right? He's six one, two hundred ninety, but they know how to use guys like that. And he had he had a couple of really awesome pass rushes in this game. He's been a piece all season long. He's just a he, he's a 23 year old guy. He's, he knows what he's doing. He's quick. He's compact. He's got really good core strength. He is very much a poor man's Aaron Donald. Um, he was awesome in this game. Um, Byron Young. They're able to get him in the third round. Who, if he was 21 years old, would have been a first round pick. He would have been drafted as like a Odafe Owe type, where he's a raw, freaky athlete. Well, he was late to football, was 25 years old coming out. They get him in the third round. He's played really well for them. So they have done such a great job of compensating their lack of first-round picks with a really unique draft strategy, and it's fun to see these guys come together. Uh, Jacoby Durant, another slot corner for them um, that has has been a good piece for them. Like, I just I, I continue to be impressed by the Rams and – they're going to get back at some point. I don't know who their long-term quarterback's going to be or, or how long it's going to take, but with the combination of McVay and Snead, like, they know what they're freaking doing, right? Like, this team, nobody really thought they'd be sitting here five and six or whatever they are um, looking at a potential playoff opportunity this year. So uh, just the Rams are, are a really impressive game, and, and it was a good, like, team culture win. They just kicked the Cardinals' ass. All right. Uh, we got four games left. Carolina at Tennessee. Very predictable game. Both offenses struggled. Both offensive lines struggled. Poor blocking. Just, like, 17-10, sloppy, boring, low-scoring game. Not a ton of opinions in terms of, like, the X's and O's of this thing. But Frank Reich gets fired after this game, and I, I think well, well-earned well firing, if you will. I, I really feel like he's been right there with what we saw from Nathaniel Hackett last year or what we saw from Urban Meyer. Like, this was a putrid coaching performance. And it I've said this before, but it is bizarre— how specifically Frank Reich's offensive lines have underachieved so much. In Indianapolis last year, you remember Matt Ryan playing behind that offensive line and how big of a joke it was? And then this year, they are up there in terms of the historically bad offensive lines. If you look at like pass blocking efficiency and PFF grades and all that, but 
when you looked at this roster on paper and how they finished it finished last year, you felt pretty good about this offensive line. It, that was like one of the selling points was like, okay, Bryce is going to have to lift up these young receivers and figure that out, but at least he should have a pretty good offensive line. And it's been, it's, it's just been wide open doors for opposing pass rushers all year long. And I, and I mean, man, like I get why Stroud people that were Stroud guys in the draft want to come out and write Bryce Young off and take victory laps. And, and you should, I mean, Stroud very clearly should have been like with hindsight, you would take Stroud number one. I said it on last week's podcast, but the tearing down of Bryce Young in the process is unnecessary. Like if if you want to say Bryce Young played like shit in this game, go for it. But you didn't watch, you didn't watch the game. Like he, he has no chance out there the receivers aren't open he's making some throws he's picking up some first downs with his legs um but he just he he, he's you know out there fighting for his life every single snap now what i am really worried about is i think over time you can lose the willingness to play aggressive and it's a combination of the receivers and the offensive line Bryce is really challenging himself still to push the ball downfield. And he did it a couple times in this game, but there's just really no verticality in this offense. Um, He he actually had a really nice throw on the run in this game, um, showing off the arm talent a little bit. And it was, this was a receiver problem where Jonathan Mingo is rolling, you know, 20 yard bender. and, And it's, it's kind of funny, you know, we want to compare everything to Stroud. Well, Stroud made basically this exact same throw, but it was it was inbounds, but very similar where he's he's trying to throw back, like basically throw the receiver into the catch. Put it where his receiver could make the catch. And he does. He put it on he puts it on the sideline and Mingo needs to slow down his momentum and come back to the ball. Mingo just like walks out of bounds and like tries to catch it with one foot in, one foot out, completely misplayed the ball. Bryce threw that exactly where he's supposed to, and the receiver just botched it. Not to mention, it wasn't until the third quarter that this offense had a run of over five yards. So there's no run game, there's no receivers, there's no, no, there's no pass blocking, there's no scheming guys open. So it's just like, it's so... It's such a wasted year for Bryce, and it just real you just really pray that it's not going to tear the guy's ability to see the field and play with confidence. There's still some flashes of Alabama Bryce Young in there, but you're starting to feel him like he he checks to the screen on fourth down at the end of this game. And part of that is on Reich. Part of that is that's in the audible set, that's in the coaching where if you get this big blitz, we can't beat it. We've got to throw the screen. Bryce checks into it. But that's just that's just timid play, right? And I don't want that to overtake his mental. So we got to save Bryce Young in Carolina. And I'm glad they fired Frank Reich because say what you want, you couldn't have risked another year of this coaching. And they got to get this offensive line fixed. It's impossible to know what all is happening in that building with Tepper kind of voicing his opinion. They did kind of hire this staff, though, where, like, everybody's got a voice, and it does feel like everybody's got a voice, but it's a game of telephone where there's no, you know, you've played telephone where you go down the line and the whoever said the first thing, you know, it's a completely different message by the time it gets through the pipeline. Sometimes you just need a coach that can tell it like it is. And this isn't a democracy, right? Like, they need new structure. They need new leadership. They need new everything in Carolina. And that goes up to the front office as well. And to be fair to Frank Reich's offensive line issues, they are out there in this game. They had four guards getting benched or injured or moved around or whatever. They had four different guards played at least double-digit snaps in this game, trying to deal with Danico Autry and Jeffrey Simmons. Cade Mays, a day uh, day three rookie in his second season, who's horrible. Something called Nash Jensen. Brett Toth, 
who has been struggling to make rosters for years. Chandler Zavala, a fourth-round pick who was a good run blocker but I thought needed some work in pass protection and certainly wasn't ready to see the field right away. Um, all of those guys had PFF pass grades under 33. And some combination of them were getting benched and move around in this game. So Corbett's not out there. But, you know, you, with two good tackles and a center, you should be able to scheme up some pass protection there. And they can't. They can't get any sort of pass pro. It's just, it, it's so hard to watch. But I was saying Scott Fitterer's got to go, man, because those were his answers at guard. We knew Austin Corbett was going to be coming off the ACL. He hasn't been able to get healthy. Um, left guard, Brady Christensen's been hurt. But I said, you can go back to my deep dive. I literally said, how is this the depth that you want to roll into the year with when you don't know what Corbett's going to look like? We Looking at this on paper, like, let me just... I think I'll be able to drop it into the podcast real quick on the fly here. I think if I pull up my deep dive graphic, actually, that's it's, going to, uh, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll, I'll cut it this in. I'll edit this in real quick. But you look at this thing, and this is really just for the people watching this on video. But, you know, everybody is in red in terms of depth. And you had the injury red mark on Austin Corbett. And this was, this video would have been made in, July, early August, but I think July. So you knew you had the whole off season. You've got guys, you know, like uh, Dalton Reisner sitting out there. Um, countless uh, options of just adequate depth that could have been acquired. They did nothing. You know, there's the guys playing right there. It's Chandler Zavala and Cade Mays. Like we knew coming into the year, they should not be options at guard and they're playing. And that comes back to Scott Fitterer, who has just done such a bad job with this roster. It's And, and this offseason was obviously a disaster. The Bryce Young trade doesn't look great. The fact that they gave up DJ Moore, um, you know, the options that they went with. You know, look at the difference between the Texans signing Dalton Schultz, a really good top 10 tight end in the NFL for a, le- a one-year $6 million contract. The Panthers decided to sign Hayden Hurst to a three-year, like, $23 million deal. Just a horrible contract. Um, the Adam Thielen signing was actually okay, um, but DJ Chark was supposed to be an answer. That hasn't worked. The drafting of, of Jonathan Mingo, when you could have had a guy like Josh Downs in your goddamn backyard, Jaden Reed, um, so many better options than Mingo. And I liked Mingo, but there was a lot. I mean, Tank Dell, right? Like, the Panthers could have been the team that had Tank Dell. No, they, they don't have Tank Dell. Um, you know, it's not just this offseason that they've screwed up, but it goes back multiple drafts now. Two years ago, they took J.C. Horn over Patrick Sertan, and this is all stuff that I've been critical of in real time. I mean, that is one of the more mind-numbing draft picks at the time, as far as first-round picks go, that I've talked about. And when that happened, I think I gave it like a B minus because I was like, I mean, J.C. Horn's a pretty good player. I like him. But how do you not take Pat Sertan? The dude was a blue chip cornerback, has been all pro since the second he stepped on the field in the NFL. And he didn't have injury history like J.C. Horn. So that was brutal. Um, And then they also took Terrace Marshall in that draft. I think they took Tommy Tremble. LaVisca Chenault, like all these draft picks have not worked out for them. And then last year's draft, holy crap, last year's draft was bad. They spend the third round pick on Matt Corral, which that's an interesting one. I didn't mind the process of that, but obviously going and trading up for Bryce Young and then cutting Matt Corral, they botched that situation. And if Corral really was this guy that didn't have the work ethic, that could have been... Like, I liked it as a YouTuber that watches the film and tells you what I think about guys' traits, but they have the opportunity to talk to these guys. And Matt Corral has a little bit of Josh Rosen syndrome going on where no one seems to believe that this guy has the work ethic or whatever it is. No one wants to give him a chance. Um, They could have weeded that out. 
And I like to think maybe I would have been able to do Like, I don't know if I could do that um, if I was the GM. I know it's hard. But the fact is they took him and the dude hasn't played in the NFL. Um, Brandon Smith was their fourth round pick. Yeah, who? Yeah, Brandon Smith was an uber athlete out of Penn State they thought could be the next Micah Parsons. Well, you flip on his film, he sucked. Same thing with their sixth round pick, Amari Barno, who I said should convert to tight end because he's a raw athlete that has no idea how to rush the passer. Maybe they should still consider moving him to tight end. Um, And then Kalen Barnes in the seventh round of that draft. Um, That whole draft has been a wash other than Iki Iquanu, who isn't even playing that well this year. So their draft last year was brutal. I mean, Scott Fitter has got to be the worst GM in the NFL right now. So I, I hope that that is coming and that Tepper can, you know, get this thing, get this organization to be taken a little bit more serious. And it seems impossible now, and I know Panthers fans are all over David Tepper, and they should be. He has not done a good job here. He needs to take some hands off of some of the operation here. It doesn't mean he can't be involved, right? Like Jerry Jones has built the Dallas Cowboys, and he's involved. But you got to listen to people, and you got to set up a leadership structure that works. So he's got he's to do some self-reflection and figure out a new structure, and he's got to do that with a new GM and a new coach. And I'll be really disappointed if they go with if they keep Scott Fitterer going here too. So I, I think that's enough time on the Panthers, um, but it, we definitely needed to spend some time on, on what what needs to change there. Um, as for the Titans, much less to take away. I, I did think Levis did a good job in this game. He made multiple just solid, firm, r- good read, good throws, good accuracy. He was on time, did what he could uh, behind a you know a, a pass a, a pretty good pass rush of Carolina. Uh, Derek Brown continues to be a monster for them. Um, but yeah, t- Tennessee took care of, took care of the game and. Levis is very clearly going to be the quarterback next year, and they themselves need to do a better job with their front office and making the right moves on the O-line um, and get some more sustainability going um, with that offense. But uh, let's move on to Chicago at Minnesota. Got to go to this game. Was a blast, despite it being a very defensive-oriented game. But, you know, the Bears pick up the win. And I think Matt Eberflus is going to be coaching the Bears in 2023. Unless they get like a little, uh, you know, black market agreement that Ben Johnson would take the job there and, and, you know, be Caleb Williams quarterback coach and that kind of deal. Unless it's Ben Johnson, I don't see why you fire Eberflus because I do think he's doing a good job with this defense. And it's just, a, you know, I think this is a thing now that with defensive coaches – Give them 20 games because Robert Sala's defense sucked for the Jets. And now Matt Eberflus, who, remember, when the Bears hired him, I, I held Matt Eberflus in very high regard. And it's obviously the offense has been a disaster, and their defense was so deprived of talent that it's taken a lot of time for him to build this thing up. But I do think Eberflus deserves credit for the defense. And they were really sound in this game. I hope Jalen Johnson is happy with this team because he's a hell of a player. And with him and Sweat, you know, they can really build something here, especially with those picks. And you got DJ Moore, a good offensive line. Like they have real pieces to turn this thing around quickly. So I do think it's very likely that Eberflus is coaching this team next year. I think he's done enough with this defense to show that he is bringing something to the table there. Luke Getze in the offense, I'm not so sure. I feel like he's probably going to be on the way out. You know, the game plan in this one really pissed me off because, you know, they're they're playing this as if they're the New York Jets or the Browns where it's like, we just, we just don't want to lose the game on offense and we have to walk out of here with a win. Like, is the win that important? Like, wouldn't you rather play a normal offense and let Justin Fields run an offense and just see what happens? Like, what if the Panthers go on a winning streak and you have to stick with Justin Fields? Like, don't you want to at least stick with him for now? Um, Or what if you get to the draft process and Caleb Williams does go back to school and Drake May is not an option? You know what I'm saying? Like, they really coached this game as if they've already made up their mind on Justin Fields. It was 
Third down was screens, play action boots, uh, boots, <laughs> QB runs. They didn't let Justin Fields open anything up. Now I get like if you are the Browns or you are the Jets and you feel like that's the best way that you can prevent him from making mistakes and just let the defense win you a football game and you need to win, I would understand the game plan. But that's not where the Bears are, right? Like they're they're three and seven or whatever they are. Like who cares if you win this game? Um, let Fields cook, right? Now Fields did not cook in this game. He was not good. He seeing being there in person. We had great seats, um, seventh row, upper deck, fifty yard line, like perfect view of like all. This is like where you'd put the all twenty two cam. Is like where I was sitting, <laughs> and uh, Fields couldn't have a worse last name. Because he can't see the fields for nothing. <laughs> there was like three times in this game where he's scrambling, he's doing his mobility thing, and that's that's sick. Like I love that he can break the pocket and get out of sacks and do all that. Like that's amazing. But when he gets out of the pocket, he's got dudes like literally jumping in the middle of the field, waving. I'm not exaggerating. There was a play he rolled left. And he ends up completing the pass. He gets 10 yards out of it. Like, sweet. He moved the chains. It was not a bad play. But (laughs) literally, in his field of vision, he has, I I think it might have been more, I don't know who the receiver was necessarily, but he is downfield. He had shaken his defender. It would have been a touchdown. There was nobody within 30 yards and right down the same sideline. And he is jumping, waving his hands, and then Fields throws the 10-yard 10 yard option and and he just is like oh gosh and i'm not saying fields is a bad quarterback i'm not saying he shouldn't be starting somewhere but you know when they have a chance to potentially draft a guy that they're hoping can be a top 10 quarterback like a drake may or or caleb williams obviously you got to take a chance to do that because if that's ben justin fields beat going back to ohio state was he just doesn't see the field and it hurts his ability to play on time. He's got this rigid release. There are blatant flaws in Justin Fields' game that I just don't know if at this point in his career are ever going to go anywhere. They were there with him at Ohio State. That's why he fell in the draft. They've been with him in Chicago. It's not a play-calling thing. It's not an offensive line thing. It's not a receiver thing. It's just him. And if they weren't, if you know, if they didn't have the Panthers pick. I would be saying, yeah, I mean, maybe you can build this thing up, get a defense, manufacture an offense that works for Justin Fields. Hell, maybe you sign Greg Roman and just get him going as like a runner first. Um, There are things to work with with Justin Fields, and he might be a prize for somebody. He might go to Atlanta and be a, you know, the 18th best starting quarterback in the NFL, and they can build a good scheme around him. Um, But the Bears have a rare opportunity to truly upgrade from that player. Um, now, it, to Fields' credit, like no one can deny that he at any point in time can make a big play happen, and he did. At the end of this game, he finds you know he scrambles, he finds DJ Moore, they get in field goal range, they win the game, and that's where having a defense is so critical for Justin Fields because if he's in striking distance, he at any moment can go make that game-winning play, and that's a credit to Justin Fields, but he also had two fumbles, two bad fumbles in the second half that made this game even close, (laughs) you know? So like he's making mistakes. He's not seeing the field. It's just, I don't know that this is really going to change at any point. So maybe the bears have made up their mind that even if maybe it is, even if they don't get a top two pick, they want something else at quarterback. I can't really blame them. Um, but it it will be interesting to see where Fields goes. As for the Vikings, it is frustrating that Josh Dobbs is on the same trajectory, and I really do think my take on this is accurate, where when he steps into a new situation, he's allowed to play fast, he uses his feet. So when they do call dropbacks, it's it's first read. Do I like it? If not, let's run. Let's break some tackles. Let's pick this thing up with his first down. But once he's with that team for three or four weeks, well, well, and I got to rewind for a second there. 
He plays faster, but also I think because he just arrived, the playbook is simplified for him. It's play action boots, it's quarterback runs, it's screen screen plays, it's being right in his ear, telling him literally like this is what the play is. If this guy is open, throw it. Um, kind of bi- I don't want to say babysitting because that's mean, but that's kind of what they do with him when he first gets in there. You'd have to do that with any quarterback. Um, but once he's there for three or four weeks, I think coaches feel like, all right, let's implement my playbook. Let's get him going. You know, he's shown this good quarterback play. Let's see if he can handle more. And then you put more on his plate. And I think what we've seen from Dobbs over the last couple of weeks is he's not running as much. The play calling is becoming more normalized. He's not making as many good decisions. Um, putting the ball in harm's way a little bit. I mean, he threw four interceptions in this game, right? Like, he, he's just not playing fast. He's not playing like Josh Dobbs. And I'm not saying he's an idiot. He's clearly not an idiot. The dude's a freaking rocket scientist, but it's like the left brain, right brain thing. I don't think the game moves slow for him. I, I think he struggles to process football information on the fly. And that's probably why he's been on five teams or whatever. So I hope I'm wrong. I I hope it was just a bad game and he can go on this playoff run. I think he's an incredibly enjoyable player. And I'm glad he's on the Vikings where he gets a chance to play. But it's been the same thing now where the longer he's in a place, the worse he gets. So if that continues, the Vikings are in serious trouble. I mean, this was not a good Bears team that they basically handed the game to with five turnovers, right? Because wasn't there a fumble in there too? There might not have been a fumble. It might have been four turnovers, but yeah, just rough day of offense. Uh, defense did their thing though. Brian Flores keeps it up. I. It looks like, to say one nice thing about the Vikings, it looks like I'm going to be wrong about my Makai Black uh, Blackman draft evaluation. He has been really good. He's stepped into the starting lineup recently. Uh, I think it's in place of a Caleb Evans. And he's been shut down, man. He's been physical against the run. He's putting that speed to the test. Uh, I just thought he was a very streaky corner in college, a little grabby, you know, not the stickiest cover guy. Definitely didn't think he was worth the third round pick when they drafted him. He's been well worth the third round pick. He He looks like a potential quality starter for them and he was kind of Flores's guy so Flores just I mean his blueprints his fingerprints rather are all over this defense and it's he just deserves so much credit but obviously uh, not a good not a good loss for the Vikes not a good loss given where they are in the standings all right honestly these last two games are very much speed mo- speed mode you got Pittsburgh at Cincinnati where Jake Browning I think I can't be the only one in this country that was watching that game. The words literally had just come out of my my mouth of, hey, Jake Browning's not playing that bad. And then at that very moment, the next throw, interception that changed the game. Um, Yeah, the the Bengals offense we knew without Joe Burrow. I mean, they're they're kind of like a a tuned-down version of when Aaron Rodgers got hurt with the Jets. Like that Bengals offense, it's it's spread things out, it's read out the quick game, it's run everything from shotgun. We've seen this Bengals offense when it's Zach Taylor's scheme with the you know scheming up play action shots and the run game and all. That. It's not pretty. This offense worked when it was passing the keys to Joe Burrow, and it wasn't surprised to see the Bengals offense struggle. Um, for the for the Steelers. This was the first game without Matt Canada, and the early signs are definitely positive. They attacked the middle of the field. Uh, They got Pat Fryermuth back. Like They are running the ball really well, too. This was a big Najee Harris game, so we've seen what Jalen Warren can do the last couple of weeks. Najee Harris kind of playing for his job a little bit in some ways was awesome in this game. So they have real playmakers, right? they got two running backs. they got a great tight end. They've got two really good receivers. And Pickett, without Matt Canada, attack in the middle of the field a little bit more, played a pretty good game. So if they can just be the 24th best offense in the league, this is a playoff team because we know what their their defense can do. T.J. Watt was dominant in this one, and, you know, they took care of business. So the Steelers just keep rolling, and there's just very little to say about them, right? Uh, then you got the Giants, 
Patriots game. Uh, I mean, how can you not be impressed with the Giants defense? They've gotten this team some wins. They almost got them that win against the Bills where this thing kind of got headed in the right direction. Uh, And then Brian Dable pairing with Tommy DeVito is, you know, figuring some stuff out. They're getting Jalen Hyatt going. They got Andrew Thomas back, so they have at least one piece on the O-line that they can count on. You know, they're uh, piecing together a competitive season uh, after I demoted them from the National Football League in place of Georgia a couple weeks ago. Uh, but, you know, good for good for Tommy DeVito. A- at some point, I'll form more of an opinion on him. He's playing better the last couple of weeks. I- I'd still be surprised if he's anything other than a low-end backup, but uh, good for him, making some noise here in, in a horrible situation. You know, he-, he threw some nice balls, you know, you know Hyatt and him have a nice nice connection there. But um, Patriots are officially canceled for the season. I, I think that was them last week where I I said, don't don't come to this podcast for the rest of this regular season expecting a whole lot of Patriots analysis, and uh, you're not going to get it. I, I can't do this two-quarterback thing. It's just them and the Jets in the AFC East are not going to get a whole lot of coverage moving forward. Um, they've been axed, but... There we go. Great show. Thank you, everybody, for listening, for watching. Uh, Really fun show. We've got um, a Drake May film breakdown going up on the channel here in a couple days. So looking forward to that. And the the Patreon picks will be up on Patreon again. So if you want to support the channel, support the podcast, you can get access to submit mailbag questions for this show. Head over to Patreon. That's patreon.com slash that franchise guy. You get exclusive content, all that. Um, Patreon gang is where it's at, but uh, really appreciate you guys for listening. Either way, if you could leave a five-star review if you're on iTunes, Spotify as well, I really appreciate it. But uh, it's enough of me taking up your time. Uh, I hope you enjoy a little good uh, Thursday night action, Seahawks, Cowboys, and we'll, we'll see you soon. Peace out.